tonight. Spare nothing to stop oil theft and illegal refining of petroleum product. River State Governor Similaya Fubara urges the Chief of Army Staff Lieutenant General Tarid Lagbata as the Army boss tours formations and units in the state. New internal crisis rocks the Labour Party as the Lamiji Apapa led group asks its presidential candidate Peter B to explain alleged discrepancies in some of his credentials presented to INEC. And the president approves establishment of a civil service commission in the FCT administration and the removal of FCTA from the treasury single account to guarantee more financial control. On business news tonight, federal government raises over 652.82 billion naira from the 150 billion naira sovereign sukuk offer as subscription level soars by 435% of the amount offered. On Sports News tonight, Saudi Arabia late strike denies a Super Eagles victory in their international friendly, which ended in a 2-2 draw in Portugal. From Abuja, the nation's capital, in a proactive move to upskill emergency management in the federal capital territory, FEMA trains volunteers on flood and risk prevention strategies. And in international news from London, Israel is telling everyone in northern Gaza about 1.1 million people to relocate to the south of the Strip in the next 24 hours. But the fight against crude oil theft leads tonight, as River State Governor Simin Fubara today asked the Chief of Army Staff, Lieutenant General Tarid Lagbaja, to prioritize the fight against theft and illegal refining of petroleum products in the state. For Governor Fubara, particular attention should be paid. Personnel may be conniving with top oil producing firms to commit the crime and even go as far as obstructing government contractors. He was speaking when the Chief of Army Staff visited him to pledge the Army's readiness to respond to emergencies and security threats. This visit of the Chief of Army Staff, Lieutenant General Tari Lagbaja, to the government house in Port Harcourt, River State is part of his routine inspection of formations and units of the Nigerian Army since assumption of office. is accompanied on the visit by the Chief of Operations, the Provost Marshal, the Chief of Military Intelligence, GOC 6th Division in Port Harcourt, among other top officials. The Army Chief in his presentation commends Governor Siminilaye Fubara for the support of the Army and pledges their readiness to respond to emergencies and threats. The Army is the people's army. We are the disposal of uh, the government to be employed to combat security challenges wherever they may arise. So the formations and units of the Nigerian Army are available. They are the disp disposal of the government of uh, River State, Your Excellency. You only need to call on uh, the GOC and they will respond to whatever security challenge in any part of the state. Governor Fubara on his part promises to sustain the administration's support for security agencies to achieve the needed peace in the state. On our part, as a state, we are already keyed into that vision to make sure that whichever way we can support not just the army, but all military formation to carry out their duties and to ensure that the purpose of their primary assignment that I achieved, but I've never relented on it. However, it calls the attention of the Chief of Army Staff to the alarming rate of crude oil theft and the obstruction of road projects in the state allegedly by some military officers. There is this road we are constructing somewhere in Abuja, And each time we will approach the company, please, why don't you allow us go ahead with our job. Maybe after a while we can. The military will always come and attack our contractors. I try to resolve the matter because I know it is not a directive from the Army headquarters. Neither is it from the civil division. Might be relationship between the company and the officers attached to that place. So but please, I want to appeal to you. But you should look into such matters. 
Governor Fubara expects that the fight against crude oil theft and illegal refining of petroleum products should be intensified in the state. And to politics, the Labour Party group led by Lamidia Kwakpa is calling on the presidential candidate of the party, Mr. Peter B, to clear the air about an alleged discrepancy in some of the certificates he presented to the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC. The group's National Publicity Secretary, Mr. Yomi Arabambi, made the demand at a media briefing in Abuja. He asks Mr. B to come clean before asking President Bola Tinubu to disclose his identity to Nigerians. Labour Party has it on credible authority that he has another brother, the firstborn of his, of his father. He should disclose his elder brother's name and his real about. What is the relationship between Peter B and the likes of IKB, JX5, and late Senator Konko in the 80s in Lagos? <clears throat> what business interest was he pursuing in the 80s in the USA with the above mentioned individuals? And whose passport did he use to travel to the US? Let him show Nigeria his birth certificate and the name. He bear on, on, on the on the birth certificate. <clears throat> now, some questions are now begging for answer as follows. Who is Peter Owubu as COB? The name he said he was given to him by his parents. Two, who is OB Gregory Owubu Asi on the white 1970 certificate? <clears throat> Three, who is OB Gregory Peter Ifin, company name Owubu Asi? on the NYC certificate. And finally, who is Gregory Peter Onwubuasi Obi on the uh, on his uh, United, I mean, uh, United Nigeria Nigerian certificate? And to Kogi State now, where the African Democratic Congress, ADC, has kicked off its campaign for the governorship election in Kababunu local government area. The governorship candidate of the party, Mr. Liki Abijide, urged the people of the area to vote for the party in the November 11th election. He promises to construct Tabunu Road in addition to other infrastructure development in the area if he's elected as the next governor of the state. It is the official flag off of the campaign of the African Democratic Congress in Kogi State. The ADC governorship candidate and his running mate also met with some stakeholders in Kaba Bonu local government area of Kogi West Senatorial District. The candidate of the party begins his campaign with a visit to the traditional rulers in Kaba and Bonu, where he promised to improve their fortunes if he's elected as the next governor of the state. When we're coming, I told my wife, I said, I pray that this is on there because we are tired of going. <laughs> you know, sorry. it's so bad. What marvels me and then and it is because you equally have your sons in this current government in the states. Next, he proceeds to the campaign ground where he asks his supporters to vote massively for the African Democratic Congress for the development of Kogi State. The ADC governorship candidate and his running mate also met with some stakeholders in Kaba Bonu local government area of Kogi West Senatorial District. We have heard from my people, they said, I have what they call a reward system. I will ensure that when we get there, even this money, it is your trade. industry. Your industry is not yet, to me, it's supposed to be more vibrant than this, oh, yes. and you need support, and we will give you that support. The visit to the villages and the road network, which are quite deplorable. Uh, I'm happy with the turnout of people uh, still in our rally ground in Kaba. 
And then you could see excitement on their face and the will to change the leadership of the state. It's our greatest wish that we'll follow it up with that. The candidate plans to take his campaign to every local government in the state in the coming days. Meanwhile, Governor Yaya Bello of Kogi State is asking residents to shun acts of violence and instead engage in issue-based campaigns. Addressing his party leaders in Lokoja, the state capital, Governor Bello says the government will ensure adequate security before, during and after the election as it warns supporters that anyone who perpetrates violence will face the law. He also expressed optimism that the All Progressives Congress APC will win the governorship election based on the performance of his administration. Less than four weeks to the governorship election in Kogi State, members of the All Progressives Congress have converged on the glass hall of the government's house, Lokoja, to brainstorm on how the party can secure victory at the poll. <laughs> Senior political figures in the party, legislators, local government chairmen, the deputy governorship candidates and critical stakeholders of the party are all in attendance. The members resolve to continue to engage the electorates for the party's success at the election. Kogi is stakeholders and Kogi is voters don't want to be left out. We would, by the special grace of God, deliver a large chunk of our votes to the All Progressives Congress and to our candidates on 11th of November 2023, inshallah. We pray for a successful, and we would, by the special grace of God, have a successful, violent free election. And we would also show our capacity in terms of delivering votes and rallying the voters to come to the polling booths and show that we want a continuity of the All Progressives Congress. 3,508 polling units, 239 wards, 21 local governments. Our job has been made very simple. Return back to base. Engage your people. Beg if you need to beg. Convince logically with facts, with figures. On election day, deliver the numbers. The commitment and assurances delights the governor, who could not hide his joy. <laughs> However, he cautions party supporters against violence and urged them to campaign peacefully based on issues. This election, we are winning. We are winning hands down. Don't engage in violence. Don't engage in violence. Avoid them. The governor is confident that the party has the necessary structures in all the words of the state and is poised to claim victory in the November 11 exercise. Well, troops of Joint Task Force Northwest Operation Hader Indaji deployed at Malakachi in Kebi State have rescued 17 kidnapped victims from terrorists. A statement by the information officer of the operation, Captain Yaya Ibrahim, says the feat was achieved yesterday when the troops conducted a rescue operation following credible information that terrorists had kidnapped unspecified number of persons at Kanya village and are trying to cross with the victims to Niger State. The troops swiftly mobilized and laid ambush at the crossing point to be used by the terrorists at Karimbena village. And the troops' firepower forced the terrorists to abandon the victims and escape with gunshot wounds. The rescued victims comprised six females and 11 males, including a police personnel who was kidnapped at Dankung Wasagu. They've since been handed over to the divisional police officer in the area to reunite them with their families. In part two, after the break, Lagos coroner inquiring into the death of late singer Ilerio Lua Aloba, popularly known as Mobad, summons music artists Naira Mali and others over the death of the 27-year-old artist. Well, that's the moment. Well, stay with us. Well, welcome back. If you've just joined us, you're watching the news at 10, coming to you live from Channel's television. But here's a reminder of our top stories. 
Spare nothing to stop oil theft and illegal refining of petroleum products. River State Governor Siminalai Fubara urges the Chief of Army Staff, Lieutenant General Tarid Rolabaja, as the Army boss tours formations and units in the state. New internal crisis rocks the Labour Party as the Lamidia Papa led group asks its presidential candidate Peter Albee to explain alleged discrepancies in some of his credentials presented to INEC. The president approves establishment of civil service commission in the FCT administration and the removal of FCTA from the Treasury single account to guarantee more financial control. And Israel alerts about 1.1 million residents of northern Gaza to relocate to the south of the Strip in the next 24 hours as it continues its onslaught of the enclave. More changes appear to be underway in the administration of the Federal Capital Territory with the President's approval of the establishment of Civil Service Commission for the FCT as well as the removal of the FCT administration from the Treasury Single Account TSA, effectively given the FCTA more control over its finances. The Minister of the FCT, Mr. Yesom Wike, made this known today during a media briefing where he stated that the President has also approved the Mandate Secretariat for Women Affairs. Our correspondent, Gloria Mezoke, reports. The Minister of the Federal Capital Territory, Ms. Danyesum Wike, has at various fora asserted the need to reorganize the FCT administration across the board. With this in mind, the less than two months old FCT minister received the president's approval to exempt the FCT from the single treasury account. The money has been given to us. Projects left, right, and the center going on. That's the only way we can survive it. And Mr. President graciously agreed with us and approved that we should pull out from the single treasury account. So that you see from next year, it will be project upon project, project upon project in the FCT. What you saw in Portugal to be exporting? What you see in Abuja was something else. He further announced other major approvals by President Tinubu. The entire civil service in FCT, they are all lost hope. Why? You cannot be here and be a permanent secretary. You can't. And you can imagine your career or all your life, what you are hoping to get to the apex of your career. But no way. Because there's no civil service uh, commission. I can tell you authoritatively, Mr. President, I've given approval for the establishment of civil service commission for the federal government. The minister equally affirms that he will drive the mandate of the Tinubu-led administration hinged on inclusivity, which is why the president has approved a new mandate secretariat. As I speak to you, Mr. President, I also approved that we have a mandate secretariat. Look, you must create a mandate secretariat that will take care of women as what you have in other states as Commissioner for Women Affairs. Meanwhile, the FCT minister assures that the approvals are in line with the renewed hope agenda, asking residents to expect insecurity and poor infrastructure to become memories of the past. From Abuja, Gloria Umezuke, Channels Television News. But to the courts now, the Lagos coroner inquiring into the death of Nigerian singer Ilerio Lua Aloba, popularly known as Mobad, has summoned music artist Abluziz Fashala, also known as Naira Mali, Samuel Lilitu, known as Sam Larry, and Owodun Ibrahim, known as Prime Boy, over the death of the 27-year-old musician. The coroner, Magistrate Adidayo Shotobi, summoned the music artist to appear before the court at the next sit-in on October the 25th. Meanwhile, the coroner has also taken the evidence of two police officers, the investigating police officer, ASP Oderende Gafara Jibola, and that of Mohammed Yusuf, both attached to the homicide section of the State Criminal Investigation Department, Banti Yaba, and the findings of the police on the matter. In their evidence, they told the coroner that there was no evidence that Naira Mali and Sam Lari assaulted Mobad. They also said that there is no link between Feishayo Gidengwe, the nurse who administered an injection on Mobad, 
and the two artists. The coroner was also informed that autopsy is yet to be completed to determine the actual cause of Mobad's death. And outside the shores of the country, Nigeria is on the right path given its recent economic policy reforms, but a wholesome approach is required, especially in generating non-oil revenue. Well, this is the outlook of the International Monetary Fund at the ongoing IMF World Bank annual meetings holded in Marrakesh, Morocco. For the global economy, the World Trade Organization is advocating reforms that shall lead to what it terms re-globalization. Our business correspondent Inijon Mekwa reports. Regional Economic Outlook for Sub-Saharan Africa topped the list of meetings five days into the IMF World Bank meeting. After giving an overview of the economic status of African countries, the Director of African Department at IMF, Mr. Abebe Selassie, settled on answering questions on countries. Nigeria's debt situation and policy reform was in view. To him, the debt status of the country is not unsustainable, although its servicing is at a risky stage, especially with low generation of internal revenue. Supply shops. And then came the global economic debate with panelists, including the president of the European Central Bank, Christine Lagarde, and the director general of World Trade Organization, Dr. Ngozi Okonjo-Iweala. The panel unanimously agree that global economy is facing one of its worst times with data capturing the reality. For Dr. Iweala, the solution lies in re-globalization. We want to say at the WTO, our analysis has shown that the vulnerabilities come from over-concentration in some supply chains and over-concentration of production in some geographies. If that is the root of the problem, then to build resilience, we need, yes, to deconcentrate and diversify those supply chains. And we are arguing that a good way to do it is not just to do it with your friends or those who are like you, but to spread your wings because we also have something called climate change. And if you cluster too many things, you don't know what phenomenon is going to happen. So why don't we look at developing economies that have the right business environment? And I insist on that. And see if we can diversify some supply chains there. So we build resilience. Some of these have been left out during the first wave of globalization. So we can build resilience whilst being inclusive. And we're calling that re-globalization. Thoughts like this seem to be driving towards a consensus that economic policies and perspectives need to change if the world would be resilient to present and future shocks. I think what's critically important is that we have an open mind and we have the humility to accept that we don't know it all, number one. The instruments that we have been using need to change and evolve and adjust and integrate new components that we haven't had on our plate, and I think that applies to models, uh, that applies also to our communication, uh, that applies to many factors that certainly have an impact on our job as central bankers. After the debate, Mrs. Zainab Ahmed is glad that in her time as Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning in Nigeria, she did not have to deal with so much disruptions. Well, actually, that was simply uh, one of the panelists stating the facts. Globally, things have become more difficult. Uh, in the fiscal spaces, things are tight for almost all countries. Interest rates are extremely high, and they're going to be stay, uh, staying higher for much, much, much longer. But there are still opportunities, which is one of the reasons I liked about this session. And the opportunities lie uh, lies, uh, mainly in trade. So we must look at how we can become more open in our, in our trade systems, remove restrictions, trade both near and far, so that we can maximize opportunities. Africans have the edge now. Africa is the future. Common notions at meetings like this. However, exploring the potentials on the continent is what the world is yet to see. Ini John Mekwa, Channels Television News. And Gloria Mezoke is back, this time in our Abuja studio with more stories on the News at 10. Hello, Gloria. Hello, many thanks, Coyote. Here in Abuja, at least...
10,000 volunteers have been trained for flood and other risk prevention strategies by the Federal Capital Territory Emergency Management Agency. The Director of Forecasting Response and Mitigation at the agency, Mrs. Florence Winnegum, stated this at an event to mark the 2023 International Day for Risk Reduction in Abuja. Mrs. Winnegum appeals to residents of the nation's capital to take personal and collective responsibility in ensuring safety, especially during this rainy season. Governor Hyacinth Alia of Benue State has defended the decision of the federal government to release funds to state governments as part of palliatives to cushion the effect of the removal of fuel subsidy in the country. The governor who spoke with journalists after meeting with President Bola Tinubu in the presidential villa also applauded the federal government's efforts in the area of security. Our state house correspondent Lanri Latsisi has this report. The former governor of Sokoto State, Senator Aliu Wamako, making his way to President Bola Tinubu's office in the presidential villa. He's one of several guests of the president. Speaking with journalists after the meeting, the senator commended the steps taken so far by the president. The president is uh, doing very well. He's working very hard. You know, it takes a uh, uh, little time to have everything we want to put in order as a leader. But the one important thing is the commitment, the determination to do the right thing. And I'm confident that Mr. President is doing his best to address issues, challenges, or challenges facing this great nation. Governor Abdullahi Suli of Nasarawa State also met with the president. He outlines the focus of their meeting. He also wanted to find out a few things about what is happening in my state, especially with the kidnap of the four students from the Nasarawa State University. He was interested in knowing what happened. So I told him that God so kind, they got released yesterday. So, and I told him who did the work. You know, the military actually did a very good job and we were able to get them released. So I told him that Delia Alake, the Honorable Minister of Mines, and I were there yesterday and we were able to do the groundbreaking of the biggest uh, uh, plant, you know, uh, in Nasarawa State, which is going to be, well, the biggest plant in Nigeria as a matter of for lithium processing, which is going to be 18,000 uh, tons uh, per day of processing. The president then observes the Friday Jumat prayers in the mosque within the presidential villa with other government officials. <laughs> Later in the afternoon, the governor of Benue State met with journalists after meeting with the president. He spoke on the issue of security and thanked the federal government for helping to ensure that displaced people in camps return to their communities. It's on record uh, to know that the programs is released have been of quite a huge benefit to us. Uh, the palliatives were quite handy um, to those who sort of feel palliatives are a wrong way to go. I said they need to understand the uniqueness of our various states, you know, like in Benue. Um, he also touched on the funds given to states as palliative following the removal of fuel subsidy in the country. We are pleased to to know that so much work has been done and relative peace is returned to the state and uh, we continue to do the work. Uh, the aim being that we want to get all the IDPs back home uh, to their ancestral homes and their ancestral farmlands. The governor also said he is optimistic the federal government will still redeem the 10 billion naira promised to the people of Benue State to rebuild their destroyed communities following attacks by bandits. Lanre Lassese, Channels Television News. Well, still ahead on the news at 10, 12 contestants qualify for the inaugural edition of Channels Television social enterprise reality show, Fund It Forward, built to start airing this Sunday. We'll join us again. Welcome back. You're still watching the news at 10, coming to you live on Channel's television. To infrastructure development in Enugu, where the state government has flagged off the construction and reconstruction of 71 roads totaling 
400 kilometers to give the state a facelift. The roads captured in the first phase would be simultaneously executed and delivered before the end of December. While flagging off the construction, Governor Peter Mba says he will ensure that the contractors build roads that are durable and efficient. The flag off of the two kilometer new premier layout road for construction within the Enugu metropolis brings together residents and stakeholders in the state. This road is part of the 71 roads with total outlay of 400 kilometers captured for construction to give the state a facelift. A resident of the community expresses joy on how impactful this road will be when completed. It will open this uh, layout. People will ply this uh, route from here to independence layout uh, uh, phase two, from here to new Enugu, from here to uh, other parts of uh, Enugu. Yes, it will, uh, uh, in fact, it's a good, uh, uh, it's a kind gesture from the governor. The state governor, Mr. Pitamba, leads his team to symbolically flag off the road and 70 others for construction. We're going to ensure that you do not have open drainage. So you're going to have the pedestrian path well paved. You're going to have street lights and you're going to be able to have a durable road that we're not going to come back to in another five years and be talking, talking about reconstruction. So the rehabilitation and reconstruction of the Enugu urban roads is commencing today with this symbolic flag off in NX. Another road that the Enugu state government is interested in is the 40-kilometer Owo Ubahu Nkem Road. The plan here is to dualize the road and the state government asks residents of the area who gathered at Owo Nkanun East local government area to be patient and cooperate with the contractors so that the road will be completed in good time. We need your support. Many farms, many communities, there will be heavy traffic on um, many heavy equipment will be in there. Just be patient. At the end of it, Well, and some cherry news. Twelve contestants have made it to the inaugural edition of Channel's Television's social enterprise reality show, Fund It Forward, which is set to start airing this Sunday. The contestants will vie for a top monetary prize while making socially responsible decisions around their already existing unique businesses. Now, this next report goes behind the director's camera for a sneak peek into the show. All right, audio roll, camera roll tape. Speed up sound. Speed up sound. Now we go in three, two, one, action. The cameras are finally rolling for the much awaited original series by Channels Television. Fund it forward. They are, they are not, they are neither expired nor counter -piece. These 12 inaugural contestants were recruited across the country with 12 original business ideas with strong social impact potential, which is a the theme of the reality show. I initially thought to um, tackle the issue of unemployment, and um, particularly youth unemployment, because of the ever-expanding youth population in uh, Nigeria. But then I came across social enterprise as an idea and thought that that cut across multiple development goals at once. So it was something better to focus on. And then I thought, instead of just giving grants to businesses uh, off screen, we're a TV station, why don't we televise it and give the businesses much more visibility? And at the same time, um, format the show in a way that educated and inspired viewers to start their own social enterprises. Some of the ideas range from educational gaming to building clean energy and so on. These ideas are pitched to a panel of judges, which include Udo Konjo, Larry Bamishabi, and Iyonua Aboyechi. So we've seen a lot of, um, you know, um, presentations around, you know, helping SMEs, around converting waste 
you know, that causes problems into products like um, gas and electricity. Uh, we've seen things around, you know, um, selling um, um, sustainable energy. You know, so so many things have been have been have been in the session, and I'm and I'm happy to be part of the journey. Each week, the entrepreneurs must balance their business acumen with their unwavering commitment to making a positive difference as they compete in series of challenges designed not only to elevate but also evaluate their budding social enterprises. But when I came the first time, I was like a misfit. I was like asking myself, why do I come here? Because yeah, I'm seeing tech guys, all of business is tech. And, but I thank God all, all of us, we are supporting each other in one way or the other. At the end of the day, at least a contestant is evicted weekly. I mean, it's been quite tough, but there's some, there's some clear, you know, I would say winners that are a bit more obvious. Um, but it's very competitive. It is very competitive, so we'll see what happens. While it is a reality TV show and there is a whopping prize money at the end, for some of these contestants, the bigger picture is beyond the immediate monetary prize. I believe that this is a great place for me to network with people that are like-minded, collaborations, partnerships, and also funding in other ways. It's going to encourage, inspire the you're going to literally change the narrative, you know, for the young people, inspire them to see like themselves are not just going into entertainment or other things that you know are not really going to create lasting impacts but this is something that creates lasting impacts so it's just going to showcase people to know that young people like themselves are actually making a very huge impact in society we want this show to just be a kind of jumping off point for these contestants not um, an end goal at all so we're hoping that once the show ends it's just the start for them and then we're going to plug them into uh, a, a network that can help their businesses grow so different accelerators mentorship and we hope that they form connections and that their businesses scale far beyond the show. Funded Forward is a channel's television's original business competition reality show that revolves around social enterprise and will air every Sunday at 7 p.m. starting from October the 15th. Well, we certainly wish them the very best. That's it from the nation's capital. It's back to you, Coyote. Well, thanks a lot, Gloria. And now to some company news. Sterling Financial Holdings has launched its non-interest banking subsidiary, the Alternative Bank in Abuja. Well, speaking at the launch of the event, the executive director of Alternative Bank, Mr. Garba Mohammed, explained that the bank will create wealth for Nigerians in a sustainable way by doing things differently. It's a new dawn for the Alternative Bank as it launches out from the Sterling Holding Company. The bank started in January 2014 as a window within Sterling Bank and is now operating independently as a financial institution following the approval of its license by the Central Bank of Nigeria. The bank promises to do things differently. From the lower echelon of the pyramid to the top notch of the pyramid, those that want to invest in gold, we have solution for them. Those that are looking for uh, financial inclusion, we have solutions for them. Those that are hungry, we have solution for them. And those that want to build their wealth, we have solution for them. The launch features three sessions as panelists dissected expectations from the nation and ways in which the bank can intervene in all the segments of human life as well as explore ways to drive solutions to boost the nation's economy. What you find in the institutions are different from what the industry actually expects of our graduates, and that's a major problem. And I feel strongly that alternative banks should look into this um, to ensure that we have the impact that we desire. The bank is introducing several technology-driven products for its customers that will transform the financial services sector in Nigeria. The delivery we have to customers are technologically delivered. Two things happen there. They are very easy to access and they are very quick and fast. You know, so these are the kind of technologies we have. We have mentioned some of our fintechs are very quick, you know, in terms of um, uh, payments and what have you. So we wait and see what is going to happen very soon, inshallah. We intend to be ubiquitous almost everywhere. Most women, our challenge is the financial backup. Where, how can we get banks that will really support and finance us? You know, we are all enter most of us are entrepreneurs, you know, and um, banks have sensitive 
very sensitive rules when it comes to loans and everything. But with the alternative bank now and um, styling product, we have got a very, very wonderful, wonderful product. According to the management, the bank is starting full operation with at least 300,000 customers across 14 branches. Stories, here's Jockey Rogers. Thanks a lot, Kayade. Welcome to Business News. In a show of confidence by investors in Nigeria's economy, the federal government has received a total subscription of 652.82 billion naira for its latest 150 billion naira sovereign SOCOC offer. According to the Debt Management Office, the subscription, which is 435% of the amount offered, shows that the level of awareness for the bond has increased with investors willing to support the government in financing infrastructure across the country. The latest SOCOC offer, which is the sixth by the federal government, brings the total proceeds generated from the issuance so far to over a trillion naira since its debut in 2017. Oil prices rose more than 5% today as investors remained on edge about escalating geopolitical tensions in the Middle East. International benchmark Brent crude futures traded 5.1% higher at $90.03 per barrel, while U.S. West Texas intermediate crude futures rose 5% to trade at $87.01 per barrel on track for the best day since April 3rd. The israel Hamas conflict has raised concerns that the fighting may affect regional energy production. Meanwhile, the International Energy Agency says the israel Hamas war has not yet had a direct impact on physical supply. Sony Group's entertainment division is set to invest $10 million in tech and entertainment startups across several African countries with a primary focus on Nigeria, South Africa, Kenya and Ghana. The company says the due diligence process has already commenced for total potential beneficiaries, although Sony did not disclose a specific time to deploy the investments or the number of beneficiaries. The company says the process will start in the coming days. Interestingly, global tech giants such as Facebook and Google and Microsoft have also begun investment in African startups. And back home now to the stock market, which ended Friday's trading session in a positive territory, extending its gain for a fourth straight day. Here's Laddie Williams with those figures. Hello and welcome to the Stock Market Report. So there we have it, three straight days of gains with the All Share Index um, closing up 0.10% for the Friday session, 67,200 points. That's for the All Share Index, staying deeper, uh, going deeper into that 67K level, market cap 36 trillion. Let's look at the um, trading action now. We see um, trading action subdued uh, today. Volume 224 million of stocks valued at 4.16 billion. Uh, less than what we had yesterday. And see deals holding on to that 5,000 um, level. Sectoral performance now, we see uh, the banking counter continuing that bullish trend, 0.10%. Uh, for the consumer goods counter, it takes a shine uh, with buying activity in Dante Sugar, National Salt Company, and Unilever, bumping up that counter, 0.64%. So uh, investors will be looking out for September inflation numbers um, next week. So I guess uh, Friday the 13th had nothing on the local boss today. End of the week, lucky. With a weekly game. That's a stock market report. I'm Laddie Williams. <laughs>
Israel is telling everyone in North Gaza about 1.1 million people to relocate to the south of the Strip in the next 24 hours. An Israeli Defense Forces spokesman said the military knew it would take longer than that to move everyone, but blamed Hamas for telling people to ignore the order. Israel has massed hundreds of thousands of soldiers on the border ahead of an expected ground offensive into the densely populated enclave. Analysts believe any ground invasion would be catastrophic for Gazan civilians. You, you can't have a ground invasion of uh, one of the most sophisticated, technologically sophisticated armies in the world into the most one of the most densely populated areas in the world um, where they have nowhere to go um, except to expect that there's going to be um, tremendous civilian casualties. It would look like a complete catastrophe. It would look like a civilian humanitarian disaster. Um, this is the sort of language that is being used by the United Nations and rights groups um, around the world. I think the language isn't alarmist. I think the language is entirely appropriate um, because I think that's exactly what we're going to get. We're talking about 1.1 million people, uh, nearly all of whom are civilians, being forced to relocate from one of the most densely populated areas in the world, from one part of that territory down south in the space of 24 hours. Um, I, I don't think that's possible. The EU is investigating Elon Musk's ex over the possible spread of terrorist and violent content and hate speech after Hamas's attack on Israel. The investigation, the first under the EU's new tech rules, will also look at the way complaints are handled. X, formerly known as Twitter, said it had removed hundreds of Hamas-affiliated accounts from the platform. TikTok and Meta have also been warned by the EU for not doing enough to tackle disinformation. A teacher has been killed and two people have been seriously injured in a knife attack at a school in France. Interior Minister Gerald Domanin said the attack happened at the Gambetta High School in the northern city of Arras. Local officials say the attacker has been arrested. Police say the attacker shouted Allah Akbar or God is greatest during the attack. The attacker is believed to be in his 20s. Seven people have died after a crowded minivan driven by a suspected people smuggler overturned. That's according to German police. More than 20 migrants, including some children, are thought to have been in the van. The driver attempted to evade police at a road check before losing control near Ampfing in Bavaria. The accident happened amid a rise in people smuggling, which has led to several Central and Eastern European countries to impose border checks. Eight UN peacekeepers have been detained over sex abuse claims in the Democratic Republic of Congo. The eight peacekeepers were deployed in Beni in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo and were arrested in connection with alleged sexual exploitation and violence. All belong to the South African contingent of the UN force and may be involved in what internal reports describe as a systematic widespread violation of UN rules. Burkina Faso's military leaders have signed a deal with Russia to build a nuclear power plant to increase electricity supplies. It is the junta's latest move to align itself with Russia after falling out with most of its Western partners. The junta has turned to Russia for economic and military support since it seized power last year. Burkina Faso is one of the least electrified countries globally with only 21% of people connected to power. And five sports, including cricket and flag football, proposed for inclusion at the Los Angeles 2028 Olympics, have been approved by the International Olympic Committee Executive Board. Organisers of the LA 2028 Games said this week they wanted cricket, flag football, lacrosse, squash and baseball, softball added to the event. Each host city under IOC rules, approved a few years ago, can request the inclusion of several sports for their edition of the Games. The IOC session starting on Sunday will now have to rubber stamp the board's recommendations. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the channel's studios in Lagos.
Thanks, Simon. Let's kick off with some optimism shared by the Minister of Sports Development, Senator John Enor, that Nigeria will advance from Group A of the African Cup of Nations to win the trophy following Thursday's draw that pitched the Super Eagles with host Cote d'Ivoire, Equatorial Guinea and Guinea-Bissau. He says all efforts will be made to rally the nation behind them as a goal for their fourth African crown in January next year. You, you know, for, for, for a team and for a country, that has the desire and the determination to win the African Cup of Nations again after several years. I mean, what it means is that Nigeria was prepared for any group whatsoever. And that is why one of the, you know, the initiatives that I brought to brief Mr. President had to do with Let's Do It Again campaign. You know, the idea is that, you know, even the campaign alone is going to be like a moral booster to our football team. Just in case you didn't watch it, it ended 2-2 draw uh, right there on this uh, stoppage time and the international friendly between Super Eagles of Nigeria and Saudi Arabia and Portugal. Salman and Farage free kick was packed into the net by goalkeeper Francis Zor. Nigeria equalized through Victor Boniface, and eight minutes later, Kelechi Enacho took the lead before the last gap equalizer by Saudi Arabia from a free kick at the edge of the box that deflected off Calvin Bassi. So you see 2-2 two, two for Nigeria. Equatorial Guinea, this is of interest to me. Guinea and Equatorial Guinea-Bissau, 1-0. And of course, Equatorial Guinea uh, against Burkina Faso, he ended goalless draw. So let's see how that plays out in the next matches we're going to play. And of course, from football, we head to tennis, where legend... Roger Federer was honored in an on-court ceremony at the Shanghai Masters. Chinese fans had the opportunity to pay tribute to the Swiss 20-time Grand Slam champion for the first time since his retirement in September 2022. The other one is the Chinese character. Four characters. Uh, our and that's it on Sports Card. It's back to you. Well, thank you, Jeffrey. And the main news again. The governor of River State, Simon Elai Fubara, today asked the chief of army staff, Lieutenant General Tari Lagbaja, to spare nothing to stop oil theft and illegal refining of petroleum products. And the inaugural edition of Channel Television's social enterprise reality show, Fund It Forward, is set to start airing on Sunday at 7 p.m. Well, that's the news at 10 for tonight, everyone. Thank you for watching. I'm Kyle Lee.